Are you stuck? Do you feel frustrated? It's probably because you're following the rules. Stop doing that. Break the rules. Change reality. Magic.me. M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. The world's greatest school for magic, meditation, and mysticism. Rewrite everything in your favor. Satisfy all your desires. And then achieve spiritual transcendence. Meet us there. We have a new mega course coming. It's going to be phenomenal. We are just wrapping it up. It is the greatest course ever. Every course we put out is the greatest course ever because we make leaps and bounds every single time. It will be out very shortly. We will probably be talking about it next week, but keep your eye out for it in the meantime at magic.me. Introduction to Magic is currently the best introduction to magic in the world, and that is preparatory to all other courses on the site now. Check it out. We've also got Adept Initiative and Alchemy of Chaos, our flagship mega courses, which, by the way, are all about achieving material success in addition to spiritual success and stabilizing yourself in our ever increasingly chaotic world. We've also got Fortuna Working, which is just about doing magic to make money, something we all want. Don't pretend otherwise. Come on. Fortuna Working, check them all out. We have them all on offer. They are available for you now. Magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. All right. And our guest today is Ramsey Dukes, one of the OGs of Chaos Magic and Magic in general, one of the greatest writers on magic in the 20th century, and also incredibly funny and personable. He dialed in to talk to us on Zoom from South Africa, and we had a great conversation. We were very, very happy to welcome him back to the podcast, and I'm sure you will be too. You can check out Ramsey Duke's books on Amazon and definitely check out his YouTube, which is called Ramsey Dukes on youtube.com. Okay, here's Ramsey. Thank you for for being on the uh, for being on the show again. It's always mm. wonderful to talk to you and have you back on. Yeah, that's a pleasure. Mm. So, uh, tell you what, I was gonna. Well, first, I, I wanted to ask you if you're if you're thinking about anything recently. Otherwise, I have a conversation starter. But I'm wondering if mm. there's been anything particularly on your mind of late. Well, I, I'm going to be giving this talk at Northampton University at the Trans States Conference. I can't remember. Did I send you the link to that? I, I don't think so. Um, and so I've been thinking what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, um, a big mm. issue. Yeah. I tend to wake up at about four in the morning and start thinking of the next bit. So that's kept me from sleeping pretty much recently. What's the, what's the topic that you're going to talk about? Well, the overall thing, um, they base... It's a yearly thing, and they base it on a particular tarot card. And this one is the magician, you know, in the traditional card. In other words, a sort of street trickster. And so the theme is around tricksterism, art, illusion, fraud, you know, all that sort of thing. And so they've got um, the people coming include stage magician, um, someone who arranges magical theatrical experiences and things like that, as well as a hell of a lot of um, esotericism, sort of academics and that. And they've asked me to do a keynote speech there. And I've never been asked to do anything like that before. So I'd say I'm thinking rather seriously about it. So are you um, still assembling what you want to say or have you decided on a topic? Well, yes, I, I, I sort of three themes, really. One is why people undervalue the subjective. You know, if, if, if you can objectify something, then society gives you credit. Purely subjective, it doesn't. So that's, and I relating that to the, um, uh, the tension between the individual and the collective. Now, I think it was in Thunder Squeak, um, I suggested, that was back in about 1980, a bit before, that the part of the challenge of the, of the Aquarian age would be the individual versus society or the individual versus the collective. And I explained the reason I said that is because 
Liz Green, the psychological astrologer, who is a Jungian, so very into sort of shadow projection and that, she suggested that the um, the age of Pisces, you know, roughly the last 2,000 years, um, the Christian era, the shadow was Virgo, the opposite sign of the zodiac. And Virgo, which we now think means someone who hasn't had sex, originally it was an independent woman. Um, and she says so the independent woman has taken a lot of projections you know, everything from sort of jokes about spinsters and that thing to the feeling in families, you know, daughters have to marry in order to be proper members of society, up to, you know, the witch burnings and the persecutions and the, and the fear of lonely women, that sort of thing. And so I thought, well, what's, what's the equivalent thing for the age of Aquarius? Age of Aquarius is very length house, you know, it's democracy, the people, equality, all those things. And opposite is Leo. And Leo is the king, the individual, the person in charge of his own kingdom. It's, and so that's why I suggested that this was the tension I could see. And I can find many examples now which seem to illustrate that. I mean, for instance, um, there was a speech by the person who's probably going to be our Prime Minister, a month or so back, saying, you know, the big challenge now is the battle from democracy versus um, dictatorship. And that's a wonderful image of, you know, Aquarius versus Leo. And uh, But I'm more interested, actually, at the other end of the scale, you know, the way that society um, persecutes the outsider, um, the idea that the loner is the person always who commits mass murder and all that sort of thing, hmm. and um, immigrants. Uh, but, of course, amongst that is the occult fraternity. Um, magicians um, are outsiders. We're not having a bad time at present. There's always that thing, you know, that um, when witch hunts, witch hunts might start again. Yeah, well, being being in America, it's, uh, it's always hovering very presently. <laughs> Yes. So that's, that's, so that's one of the themes. And then, of course, I'll just look at the various sort of trickster footprints for our society and how it um, plays with those two uh, contrasts. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, so that's pretty much on my mind. That's really yeah. interesting. I've thought about that a lot in terms of the Aquarius-Leo split in terms of the Aeon of Horus and that tension that seems to be there, at least in how Crowley depicted it. And... You know, on one, you know, if you take even just if you take the book of the law on one level, it seems so obvious to me that the whole every man and woman is a star has come spectacularly mm. true. Everyone is famous for their fifteen followers, or fifteen thousand, or fifteen million followers on Instagram or 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 social media, and even the whole idea of the king has been replaced by the star of the 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 celebrity. Yet at this, and at the, so on the surface, we seem to be a completely individualistic society. The whole thrust of society or consumer society seems to have been to democratize mm. the experience of, of celebrity and fame. Whereas, mm. when, where, you know, it used to be the Beatles being unbelievably famous, bigger than Jesus. Now everyone wants to be the, you know, everyone wants to be that. Um, but at the same time, it seems to me, there's just an unbelievable, this may be one of the reasons for the unbelievable malaise in our society. It's like people don't actually want, I think that secretly people mm. don't, maybe not so secretly, people don't want to be individuals. They find it to mm. be a burden. And you recently did a series of videos about cults. And I think one mm. of the big draws of cults is, and of, of mass populism or fascism mm. even, has, mm. as has been pointed out, is that people want to be relieved from that tension of having to perform their own individuality because it is a tremendous burden that, to be fair, that people just energetically mm. and, and cognitive, cognitively that people before the 20th century didn't have to mm. manage, you know, they didn't have to like manage their brand just to be a normal person, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there's two things that um, strike me about that. One is I was going to draw attention to the uh, the sheer trickery 
in that distinction between the individual and society. And there are many examples I have, but one is the fact that uh, there is this tremendous suspicion of the loner, the outsider and everything. And yet there's this tendency in society to create kings, as you say, the cult of celebrity. You know, um, now I was always struck by this thing, you know, there is the um, sort of Bob Dylan up on the stage and there's a half a million people applauding, you know, worshipping, really. Um, and uh, many of them think, I wish it was me up there, you know, wow, it must be incredible, yearning for celebrity. And yet, if it wasn't for the people watching, it wouldn't be a celebrity at all. In fact, it's a God that's been created by the crowd, you know, and this sort of ridiculous tension between the two. And then the other thing, of course, that society does, it loves putting these people on a pedestal, making them into gods. The other thing it loves is knocking them off the pedestal. <laughs> you know, the media spends half its time announcing the new wonder person, that sort of thing. The other half of its time finding out that the last wonder person was a child molester <laughs> or whatever. You know, it's sort of, you put them up and knock them down. It's just sort of yeah. such a behavior. That has always struck me as very ritualistic and and probably innate to humanity also. I, I always related that to, you know, James Frazier in The Golden Bow talks about the scapegoat ritual where a tribe will prop up like a virginal child mm -hmm. and dress them with flowers and then throw them into a volcano afterwards. Uh, guess, and you yeah. see this in a lot of places in the world. Even in um, Kathmandu, they still do it where, where they'll have a 10 year old girl that they nominate to be the incarnation of the goddess the kumari and they they oh, make yeah. her the center of the whole you know the whole culture and she's like the considered to be the the living incarnation of 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 uh you know of shakti of the goddess and 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 everyone worships her but then as soon as she hits puberty they basically just throw her out and, she, and they, they always end up, you know, then they go to the next one and they, they always end up essentially just having to survive through prostitution and being homeless. Uh, so yeah. it's brutal. And, but, and, and it's easy to look at that and say, well, this is such a, you know, how could they do this? But then you just turn on the news and you can see that we're doing it as well. You know? yes, <laughs> like, yes. like child celebrities and things like that. Yes. That's extraordinary, isn't it? That, um, yes, yeah, because, uh, Something I associate with it is um, Crowley's idea of the aeon of Osiris is the aeon of the sacrifice gods, you know, the victim gods who sacrifice themselves for humanity. And um, uh, sometimes, well, the media does this, you know, where the most uh, powerful thing you can be in our society is a victim. Everyone's on your side. Mm -hmm. You become godlike as a victim. You know? um, and uh, again, that's the sort of thread running through the media. Um, that, uh, yeah. And people, therefore, um, can fall back on the victim role rather than actually becoming individuals and pulling themselves out of it. You know, um, the government should be doing this for us, and it isn't. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, another theme which... Um, uh, yeah, the victim as um, the victim as hero almost. Is, uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's new. I'm trying to think. That's pretty new, though. I'm trying to think of examples of that prior to the last couple generations, mm -hmm. uh, and other than the obvious, you know, Jesus, <laughs> or you know, like various other sacrificed messiahs. I guess. Well, okay. So I guess it, if you consider that, it's not uh, particularly mm -hmm. new. But that raises another question, which is when I'm hearing that, which is what tokens are people playing for in that game? And mm -hmm. the reason I thought of that is you were mentioning that in regards to people didn't always do that. Um, mm -hmm. But the question there is, are people in our society now playing for resource tokens or attention tokens? Mm -hmm. Like, are people actually going to get more resources or ability to survive from not just claiming victim status, but interacting with the media sphere at all. Or mm. it, it just seems to me that the l trying to gain position within um, mass perception, mass electronic p perception is just inherently not related to one's physical survival, perhaps, although I imagine it could seem like yeah. that. Yes, because if you can sort of... Um, uh, 
you know, put out a tweet or something about you've been badly done by by someone, you know, and then suddenly you've got a million followers um, all supporting you like mad. It's it's tremendous sort of social capital in that. Um, but as you say, well, I suppose you yeah you can monetize that, can't you? You know, it's it's um, but it's, it's it's a very strange trade that uh, must say it puzzles me. Hmm. I think actually, there's you know, it's a, it it needs to be examined from a magical point of view. That um, yeah, it's really is something out of nothing. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I'm kind of thinking towards. I'm, 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 mm. I'm. That, that's a better way of putting what I was trying to say. And one of one of the one of the ways that you know, I, I tend to end up looking at at cultures and also also magical orders and magical systems just from a transactional analysis perspective of what game are people actually playing here and yeah. it seems to me that our culture now despite being so technologically sophisticated is is definitely playing kind of more and more atavistic games in, in that sense but I, I guess the, the the question there is if we're talking about something like Aeons, Aeon of Horus, Aeon of Osiris, or it could ad- another way of talking about that just be that the, the game shifts in society or the rules of the game begin to change in, in different time yeah. periods. And do they? Mm-hmm. Is that even an accurate... Like, can we even say that? Or maybe not? I don't know. I, I think one of the things that... Um, I mean, I, I go along with Crowley's thing of the three Aeons, you know, and we you know... Um, the end of Horus, but I'm also very much aware that uh, different people are in different aeons in their thinking, and um, and an individual actually, you know, uh, I can think of myself as Thelemic, you know, and uh, yes, you know, but I remember one time when, um, as a teenager when I went up in a really rough hell to skelter, you know, a sort of fairground ride, <laughs> and afterwards we confessed we were clutching. The free copies of the Gospel of John have been handed out <laughs> as we were doing it, you know. So we were back in the, sort of that era, and then um, when um, you know, in, in tough political times, you get this cry: "We need a strong leader." That's really going back to the the uh, um, Aeon of Isis. You know, we just want to be told what to do. Yeah. We can't, can't even make decisions like we would in the Aeon of Osiris. So I think that, that um, uh, it has to be borne in mind. You can see the overall things happening with the different aeons and separating them. But also people will slip back to previous things under pressure or some people just naturally are more comfortable um, still in a previous aeon. That's a really good point. And it, it's a self-obvious point now that I'm thinking about it, but I haven't really thought about that before and you don't really hear people talking about that because there very much is this um well let me put it this way i mean crowley's when crowley talks about the aeons and of osiris and horus he's he does it in such this broad broad way of it is now the aeon of horus but then it just became clear to me that well maybe these are ways of talking about different states of consciousness rather than um Mm. some type of literal historical architecture in the sense that obviously there are lots of people in the, you know, there are lots of people in the world living in the Aeon of Horus and they're making, you know, eight figures playing video games online or something Mm -hmm. like that. And then you have people who are struggling are struggling to uh, make subsistence farming work and they're clearly Mm -hmm. not living in, and, and all of this stuff is coexisting all at the same time. So Mm -hmm. I think the idea of saying that there's some, overarching narrative to history is a little bit um, just doesn't play out under scrutiny Mm. but I think that your point of well but even with individuals you know somebody's gonna somebody's gonna push back to even if we just say like somebody will regress to earlier states of development under stress is very Mm. true in my in my experience Mm. for sure Mm. and I think that uh, people know that and that's one of the reasons why there are so many political techniques or media techniques even for regressing people into childlike states for instance in cults i think as you've talked about you know like the first thing that so many cults do is um 
use techniques to regress people to a childlike state. And I think you make a point in one of the videos that it's like, well, then if there is abuse within cults, it's like, you know, can you really say it was consenting adults if they've been intentionally regressed to a childlike state, which is a pretty dark point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Now, what was it that made me? Oh, yes. Because one of the things that, um, uh, you know, there's also the self-deception about which aeon you're in. I remember in the 80s, it was quite a thing of, um, you know, it went well with heavy metal and everything. Um, people saying, it says in book, in the book of the law, you know, was it kill and plunder or whatever it is, all those things. So, you know, as real Thelemites, we should be <laughs> going out and committing murder or whatever. But um, what strikes me is that uh, they actually, they're taking it in a Aeon of Osiris way. Because the Aeon of Osiris really is about setting an example. You know, how should I behave? The imitation of Christ. The right answer is to behave what a perfect person would do in these circumstances. You know, it's like your parents, you know, um, their perfection. You must try and do what daddy would do. You must try and do what Jesus would do, sort of thing. Now, Aeon of Horus is more like the teenage stage. You've got an angry God here, a father who's turned out to be not perfect. Perfect Perfection was something that's inspired you for a long time. And what is the nature of Horus? Is actually, it's an angry God. Now, I don't think Horus, my impression of Horus, he doesn't respect someone who just does what he says. So if Horus says, go and kill, um, he has much more respect for the person who says, I'm not going to kill, it's not my nature, you know, it's not my will to kill. In other words, um, the people who read the book from the we must do what it says, they're actually reading it more like a end of Osiris scripture hmm, interesting know, lessons in what how you should behave and you know what the best perfect do whereas actually it's challenging you to read this stuff and see how you react to it what do you want to do in the face of this angry statement from God you know? yeah that's definitely that's interesting and uh, you can definitely tell when people miss the point of that <laughs> But I love this, this scene going on behind you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like he's uh, speaking What's of happened to the black thing. <laughs> speaking of Horus, yeah, he's the, the pure. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's uncontrollable. Um, he's about a, a year old. I got him as a puppy, he was about that big. Uh, Charlie, hey, speaking of Helter Skelter, so um. So that's really interesting. So one of one of the things about the Aeon of Horus that made so much sense maybe earlier, and I remember even chaos culture in the 90s, there was mm. su- such this drive to rebel, tear down, destabilize reality, and the whole idea of the whole idea of the Aeon of Horus of this kind of like antichrist uh, uh, mm. stance of tearing down Christianity and, and tearing down the last 2,000 years. Well, now it's 2022, and my question is and has been for at least 15 years now, what exactly are you tearing down? It's like <laughs> the idea that there's there's any type of, you know, controlling authority now, you know, mm. is just, is you know, it's just, it, it is chaos, and now we have to deal with it. Mm. And, and mm. I, I think even with people like Trump or conspiracy theories and things like that like people are desperately trying to create some type of controlling patriarchal authority but you know it's like even you can tell they wanted trump so bad to be the new hitler but he's just not capable of doing it it's just like you know just falling apart under pressure so Uh, it's it's it is like that thing again of um you know we want a strong leader in other words we want someone to make our decisions for us that type of thing um uh, stepping back from really being a free person and um, uh, thinking of yourself, uh, just if someone would, and that of course is part of the attraction of the cult. You know, uh, suddenly your responsibility is lifted because you do what the leader says. You know, and it's a it's a wonderful childlike buzz you get from that. You know, <laughs> but but then eventually the the leader has to be torn down also in the same way. Mm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, I don't know. It's um, it's living living in the midst of it. It's harder to see it, isn't it? Really, that people look back and say, "Oh, that's what happened in the twenty first century." Yes, that's it. <laughs> it fits some pattern. 
Yeah. It's, um, well, let me take you the path when me, you're living it. Yeah, it's and it goes by so fast. Also, it's it's it, mm. it's, it's, it's like it feels like a new reality every day now. Um, <laughs> so I guess I guess chaos magicians got what we wanted. Um, the so so let me let me ask the very controversial and loaded question that I was going to start off with, um, mm. and just to lead into it just talking about like the the role the individual versus the collective the state of things now obviously you mentioned people who are into magic or spirituality in a true sense or you know are outsiders and are mm. by if they're sincere are to some extent trying to escape whatever their cultural context is which mm. automatically has a lot of assumptions in it for instance, that the individual will be more capable of perceiving truth than the collective, which is maybe something we could also question ultimately. But, mm -hmm. but outside of yeah. that, my question is, here's my loaded question. Is there such a thing as actual spiritual progress? Mm. Well, I feel I'm making it, should we say, you know, when I look back, um, I feel I'm getting somewhere. Uh, spiritual progress. I think that um, something you just mentioned a sentence or two back about um, uh, what was it uh, about going towards truth? Was it you said? I can't. I'm trying to remember. Uh, you see, truth tends to be defined by the collective. You know, that's why I was saying. Why does objectivity given so much more value than the subjective. Um, you may have some wonderful spiritual experience or something like that, hugely value to you, but it isn't really until you can objectify it and present it in such a way that other people say, wow, you're right, you know, or yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, it's, uh, it can't really be claimed to be true until the collective has Hmm. Put that stamp on it, you know. Yes, society says this is true. Um, so, uh, spiritual progress would only really be registered if um, it's moving towards something that society accepts as progress. Um, uh, so, hmm. So something like um, the Green Movement, uh, I remember, you know, like in um, the 50s, to be a vegetarian was a crank. You're a crank. And in fact, the most successful, the first really big sort of chain of vegetarian restaurants in London, um, there were vegetarian, vegetarian restaurants, but they were little places in back streets, you know, for hippies and that, was, was called Cranks. Because it was, you know, like <laughs> reclaiming the word queer. They said, okay. yeah, Crank's restaurant, and it became a great favorite or something. So, um, but of course, now that is mainstream. And okay, there are plenty of people in companies which are not doing it properly. But I think people would say that is, um, where you put it in inverted commas, spiritual progress. You know, nowadays, there are things we frown on, which um, would be, be not not noticed in the past. So again, it's sort of a shift in society, which says this is progress. And um, now, then, if I look at it as an individual, I would agree because I say it feels like progress to me. Um, but it's really it's that stamp of um, society saying this is progress, uh, which objectifies it and makes it into sort of guaranteed progress. I know it's sort of registered protest. Um, yeah, that's interesting because obviously that dynamic is so important in occult groups as well, where, you know, people are having all these crazy experiences, but it is the recognition of the group that they are valid in some way that really concretizes it it's like oh well you've attained this degree or you or you got you know you did the, you did the procedure correctly and this is the this is the result 
the correct result. And I, often I found there's a, a lot of um, doubt until there's some type of recognition that there can mm. be in those experiences. But yeah. however, you know, as, as you often see with occult groups, people don't tend to really make progress until they go off completely on their own in my experience. Mm. And the, the classic example would be abramelin, which, or, or mm. long periods of meditation, things like that, which by their nature mm. have complete social isolation as their basis. Mm. And yeah. so then the question, I guess, I guess my question at a deeper level was not just about society, but for the individual. Like, is there actually such a thing as spiritual progress that can be made by somebody through their own spiritual efforts, or are they really just sparking lots of different, you know, are they really just kind of going through different mental experiences that appear to them to be linear, but are really just, they're just, you know, firing things off in their brain over the time of, over the time of their life. And there's really nothing, no uh, quote unquote, true progress being made. I think that's what I meant when you know when you first put that question, and I said I think, I think I've made spiritual progress because really for me, um, on my sort of diagram of you know the four ways of four directions of thinking, I've got religion opposite magic, and you know and some people say oh shouldn't they be side by side because they're both about spirit and things like that, and um, I say the reason they're opposite of mine is two things one is the direction of it. On the whole, magical operations bring spirit down into matter, you know, make something into a power object, make um, a ritual which brings spirit down. Whereas religious things tend to be raising people up to spirit. So that's one opposite. But the other is this very thing about religion really is binding people into communities, into groups, whether it's around supporting a football team or whether it's... um, uh, you know, a particular academic discipline or whether it's an actual religion or a, a national nationalism or something like that. It's, it's a thing which sort of unites people into the group. Now, um, so that's what I'm getting at a bit about why does it we undervalue the subjective? Because to me, magic is about the subjective effect. You, you have a wonderful group ritual and everyone says, wow, that was tremendous, wasn't it? But really the value of it is, is what it did to the individual participants, you know, how I feel after that ritual myself. I can enjoy all the, the camaraderie, you know, the feel of joint thing. That's great. But what has it le- done to me when I come away from that? And as you say, something like the Abramelin operation is a supreme form of that because you are doing it on your own. Um and uh, experiencing it on your own. Now, I think one of the uh, things that was difficult for me doing the Avram Malin is, and I think a lot of people feel this, they're looking for the thing that will impress society. <laughs> you know, um, if I come out uh, able to make food appear on a table from nowhere, do things like that, wow, you know, that would prove that Avram Malin was worth doing. Um, uh, if I could sort of walk on water or something, you know, that would be fantastic. But actually what I had to judge is what change it made in me and what change it initiated, you know, what change for the rest of my life, what changes, uh, that really is what I'm given. And, the, and for me, that is what the, what was valuable. On the other hand, I wish I had something that I could just demonstrate, like a conjurer, <laughs> to, to, to get to, to re- have its value recognized by society, by the group. You know, that's such an important point. Yeah, I know. Or it could be the idea that you're going to become some great person on the other side of it, or you know, mm. that that mm. I think that magic, in particular, not just magic, but the idea of undergoing quote unquote spiritual processes in general lends itself to self mythologizing in that way that you're going to come through this and become your ultimate self, or you're going to become an important and significant person in some way. And one of, one of the dangerous things I think about particularly meditation or periods of isolation like that is that you're constantly 
changing that story in your own head over and over again. Like, I'm going to be this person. I'm going to be that person. I'm going to come out of this as, 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 you know, a great leader or a great artist, or it's like, it's like you're, you're kind of going, potentially going through this self interrogation where you're just imagining all of these people that you could be, but you're not actually, you're not those people. And you're just kind of sitting there imagining other people you could be in other dimensions and it kind of goes on forever and and that's really kind of insidious in a way but the the point that you made of the all of that is to impress society and perhaps Mm. therefore not only prove that magic is real but that you are real (laughs) Mm. uh definitely seems to be the common denominator of a lot of that and that's a really wise thing to say of just it seems to me just removing completely the idea that you're going to get any that you just removing the idea that you need validation for what you're doing probably mm-hmm. would undercut a lot of that um grandiose type of that grandiose mm-hmm. cycle perhaps yeah. that's um that's very interesting because it's it, it you you make me look again at you mentioned those cult videos i think it's the third one i talk about how you create a cult and I gave two examples that I did. Um, well, I gave one example of another person who faked being a guru. Um, you know, and there was a movie of that, and it was very interesting. You know, uh, it was sort of on one hand it was a fraud, on the other hand it was a very interesting experiment. And he found to what extent he actually began to experience some of the things that he was hmm. telling people they ought to experience. So that was interesting. But um, the key thing that was different from my one was that instead of me coming in as an unknown guru and plenty, I told people to make that of me. Um, Interesting. You know, I, am, uh, I said, you know, his divine holiness, Sri Baba Rebox, is going to be visiting you, <laughs> and you are his disciples, <laughs> and you absolutely worship him. He's gone on earth to you, and all that sort of thing. And so um, I was in extraordinary possession of becoming this great guru, but... I'd ask them to make me into the great guru. Interesting. So um, I wasn't, um, yeah, it sort of got around that thing you're talking about. Um, uh, I would make, uh, I said, you know, part of the trouble of this is because if you put questions to me or if I make a sermon and it's good, you will say, oh, yes, Lionel Stowe is a very clever person. And that's why I did that thing of I, I wrote down words, you know, like spirit, love, peace, oneness on bits of paper. And then things like apple, ocean, you know, useful metaphors. <laughs> and so when I gave my talk, or when I, uh, people asked me something, I took out these strips of paper and strung it together. You know, um, love is like an apple. <laughs> 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 I said, so you know, it's all random, you know, something. But they still had someone afterwards who said, you know, I followed a guru for many years and your wisdom was even better than <laughs> That's <his."> great. <laughs> so, it's very much about, about you know, um, you are the one who put the person, the, you know, the, the pop star up on the pedestal. Yeah. You, as people, um, let's really explore that relationship. How, if you give value... You can be repaid value, um, and uh, so yes, it sort of addresses what you're saying. That's it's, interesting. Um, I think people, yes, if people think they've got to deliver that, and I was trying to show that if you give me that value, I can't help but deliver it back to you. And as I say, they thought oh, I was amazing. Well, that's such that that demonstrates such a. I mean, such a deeper magical principle, principle though, where it's just, you know, the, that is like an invocation in a way, or, or a, a, maybe a better way to put that would be the role comes out of the context or the role comes out of the context. If you play, you're playing the same guru game with other people, then you're going to get a guru result. And so the, the quote unquote power is not coming from some transcendent maybe in your case it did come from a transcendent supernatural source but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know it, it it's it's coming out of the situation in, in the same way that of the classic thing of well 
you know, people can be political reformers and they can be incredibly well-meaning, but as soon as they get into that position, then they inherently have to make all the quote unquote same mistakes that they were fighting against in the first place. They inherit all of the quote unquote mistakes of their predecessors because they're inherent to the, to the role, to the situation. It comes out of the, it comes out of the, the, the game, not the, the individual who happens to be in that role. And, and I think that, that, uh, that that's true of anything in life, including even playing roles in a family. It's like you kind of inherit that that energy that people lend you. And I think that one big mistake that people make, I mean, it obviously applies to the, the guru thing, but one big mistake that people make in magic is, Genesis always used to say this to me, it's like they 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 make the slip of instead of their... Well, as Genesis put it, instead of wielding power, they think they are power. Or as I as, right. as I will put it, it's like you know, it's like you because because you know, like somebody who's not as self aware as you could easily have been put in that position or or put themselves in that position where you're propping themselves up as the guru, but then started to believe it, right? Yeah. And then all of a yeah. sudden, you think you think, well, you know, you know what? Maybe this is coming from me. You know, even if it started as a joke, and there's so many people in the mm. magical culture that that's obviously was the case with the Carl. I think Carlos Castaneda is an obvious example of somebody who started off kind of faking it, but then, then it started working yeah. and he started saying, well, maybe, maybe I am a shaman, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Actually there was there's something which I look back on um, and I see new things in it. Um, and that was, um, you know, as I say, here was I, his divine holiness, Sri Baba Rebop. You know, and they're all washing their feet. And they started um, the mantra I gave them, you know, uh, Ram Fat Yamaha Vashna Dishnu Hum. Uh, <laughs> you know, after the second day, someone said, damn you, I woke up with that mantra on my mind. You know? And then, then, the, then the miracles started. Um, and you could see how they started because uh, we were in this great big courtyard and waiters would come out and serve us. Sort of so there's a table where there weren't any waiters coming. They were waiting, waiting. So they started the mantra, Ram Vat Yamaha Vashidishu Hum, um, the, and then a waiter came out. Oh, we've manifested a waiter, you see. So the miracle started. <laughs> um, but the most amazing one was um, on the last night, uh, they put great big tables out, you know, long tables in the courtyard, um, and uh, we had a final sort of feast, farewell feast. You know? And so there was I, you know, um, just at the table. And um, it happened that that night, another part of the um, castle was uh, they were having a wedding party there, you know, the wedding and they were having a celebration. So you had these drunken um, Austrians sort of going to and fro in the distance, and everything like that. <laughs> Some some swine told one of these drunken Australians that there's a very holy man here who can do miracles. <laughs> so suddenly I was faced with um, this person and, and fortunately the interpreter was there. Yes, he, he, he um, wants you to put a great blessing on, on, on the bride and groom. <laughs> and I, I sort of, you know, oh my God, you know, what am I supposed to do? So I said to him, look, uh, all the people in your coach um, that you arrived in, if you get them to sing this this um, holy mantra, Ram Fat Yam Maha Vashna Dishnu Hum, um, but um, you'll bring very great blessings on on the um, on the couple, you know, and their marriage will be blessed. And he was so grateful, he, he took out his wallet and was handing me fistfuls of notes. And I said, No, no, I can't do that. Here. I thought, oh, yeah, it's too holy. I can't take money like that. Um, now. You see, the interesting thing is that all the people on that table were in on the joke. You know, <laughs> they were having a good laugh at this. Um, but this person had been, I'd been introduced as a holy man, you see. And there he was off this money. And I refused it. And um, he thanked me very much and he went away. But he went away, not just out of the door, he went into the kitchen. And then... Um, We'd had these great jugs of water all the way down the table. Waiters came with identical jugs, took those away and put the jugs on the table and went away. And someone looked at him and says, it's wine. His holiness has made water into wine. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was amazing. 
<laughs> but when I look back many years later, I realised not only had I changed water into wine, but I'd done it at a wedding feast. So that's I mean, pretty good. Yet. So, yeah, so, um, so the interesting thing there was, you see, having sort of created this magic, not as the great guru, but you know, between us, let's together create magic, and I become the great guru. And there's someone who only thinks I am the great guru. He hadn't been on a, in on the joke at all. And they have become part of the magic. <laughs> Their sort of gesture of thanks means that it's only as now changed water into wine. You know, I wonder how Jesus did it. Was it the same thing? <laughs> but uh, I just find that extraordinary when I look back at it. You know? That's funny. Um, Although, yeah, yeah th there's that's that's a great Zen zen cone story on so many levels i think uh although could you say you know the person who came up to be blessed in a sense was the one who was in on the joke and the other people weren't be because for him the magic was real mm -hmm. so because presumably okay. he went away believing that he was blessed and his, his marriage was blessed or this person's marriage mm -hmm. was blessed and so and, that, and that, isn't that kind of the thing with magic where it's like you know you you may think it's a joke but he doesn't mm -hmm. so is it really a joke at that point or is it to, uh, you know because now that person's going to remember think back throughout their marriage and say well you know our marriage was blessed by this holy man so maybe yeah, when yes. things are rocky that'll be yeah. now like a touch point that he thinks of and it's like yeah. well but that person said it was blessed so you know it, we must we should Actually, hang it's on true. <laughs> you know now he's a real magician uh -huh. because he took this mantra, got everyone singing it in the coach, and it led to a happy marriage. So he's the one who actually did the magic. Um, we had set it up, and, and there was the real thing. Yeah, that's a way of looking at it. I think that's really intriguing. Yeah. Or, or is it possible, perhaps, that this person actually manifested the whole thing because they needed there to be this thing happening at their wedding to have a sense of blessing on it so they act, he actually brought you all in and summoned you in a sense by the the need that he he needed his wedding to be constructed in such a way and you just happened to step into his script yeah yeah we're gonna we're gonna hold the wedding feast at the place where these magicians are meeting you know right right <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that is extraordinary that but it's um yeah the thought of him in the coach telling people to sing this holy mantra and telling them this is going to bless the bride and groom. That's amazing. Um, you know, but you see, it's a very good example of the, the role of the trickster because, um, I didn't play a trick. I just showed everyone, you know, how to, how to make a trick and make it work. And, um, so it, it's like that essay I wrote called The Charlatan and the Magus, where I was pointing out the very thing that we're addressing in this conference, that, um, that uh, the if you think of the tarot trumps as spiritual growth, you know, a spiritual exercise, a spiritual path going through the trumps, does it begin, where does the, the um, spiritual path begin? Is it with the hierophant? Is it with the high priestess? No, it begins with a fool. Well, okay, you can, some people say the fool's at the end. But the next card is a trickster. And in the old cards, he's not a great magus. He's a, um, uh, a street conjurer hmm. pulling tricks. Um, and so in that essay, I said that uh, the trickster, the charlatan, is an important figure at the beginning of your spiritual progress. And what I meant by that is that um, I'd known many people looking for a guru or a perfect example. Again, the search for perfection, which really is an Os Osiris thing. Um, and they, you'd see them, meet them in the street one year. How are you getting on? I found an incredible teacher, absolutely amazing, you know. Um, he's, I found I found my path at last. You see him a year later. How are you getting on? Uh, oh, I'm okay. What about your your teacher? Oh, that bastard! I discovered he was sleeping with his acolytes and everything. I, you know, I won't have anything to do with him. But what about the amazing gifts he gave you? Oh no, no, the man's a hoax. And 
I suggest that the reason the trickster comes at the beginning of the path is because he gives you a, a watertight excuse to give up. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Interesting. I'm really impressed when I'm reading Crowley. Then I discover about the bad things he done. Oh, no, Crowley's a bad man. I'm not going to follow him. Um, but uh, the trickster, uh, the crook, <laughs> whatever it is, the dubious guru, comes at the beginning of the path because he gives you an easy let out to stop doing magic and go back to normality. Interesting. Um, and I say that's really part of, that's the first bit of the initiation. Interesting. Because the end of Horus thing to do is to recognize that Crowley is, might not be a person you would really like to live with or to know too closely. But when you look at some of the things he says, they're so thought provoking, so educational, so inspiring, that you learn yourself as an individual to choose um, what is best out of that and work with it rather than waiting for some perfect person to tell you exactly what you've got to do. And, um, yeah. yeah, I agree completely. I just wrote the introduction to the new edition of Lon My Little Cat's book about um, Thelemic Magic. And oh, I was yeah. thinking about Crowley a lot in that. And I, you know, I... I kind of made the point, it's like kind of everyone kind of goes through that experience with Crowley and the, but the point, like Crowley is beside the point in a way. I mean, he's a great writer, but he's been dead for 75 years now. And mm -hmm. the, it's, you know, it's not do what, or it's not supposed to be do what Crowley will. It's supposed to be about what you. So it's, it's, and it's so interesting. And so many people have that experience. And I, I think that in a, in a way, Crowley almost perfectly constructed his whatever his psychocosm that he left behind because it's it's so disturbing in all of the right ways and and so um, off-putting in all of the right ways and the the point of the point of what he's saying is that you're supposed to dis in the, you know at its base level that what, what he's saying is you should discover your you know find yourself right mm -hmm. not him. <laughs> you know? So by by kind of undercutting and making him by making himself a terrifying and disturbing and upsetting individual in a way, um, it does put that you really have to want to dig through that. And it, it mm -hmm. kind of forces you through the the I think hopefully it does. And I mean, a lot of people just emulate his bad behavior. So there's that. But mm. um, it should ideally kind of force you into that kind of confrontation. Well, what, what, it, what do I think is right or not mm. for me, like by his mm. very existence? So yeah. um, it's um, uh, another thing, you know, I don't think in terms of aeons as being very, you know, press the light switch, we're now in the next one. But it's quite interesting to see the things that were happening at in 1904 and around that time. Mm. And um, Crowley, in that way, is sort of part of a, a movement that was happening because Gurdjieff, um, another sort of great guru to many people, he, I understand, he sort of walked out on his followers at one point because he wanted to try to see what would happen when he's no longer there. Huh. He was aware of the thing about the trouble of being a center, you know, a guru for a cult, is what happens when you die, you know, does the cult fall apart, whatever like that. And so he did that test. And I know that um, Rudolf Steiner uh, didn't want his lectures, he only wrote about a couple of books, I mean, not much. He didn't want his lectures to be written down because he said, look, this is a living movement. You know, it's what you do with it. Um, but it was his disciples who said, no, no, this is too good. This is too precious. We must write it down. So you've got all these volumes and volumes of his lectures, uh, which they refer to. But it's worth remembering that he didn't want that done. He wanted to set a living thing in motion. So that sort of um, uh, people... So there's three examples of people who are trying to work with the idea of, you know, we want to help people to evolve spiritually we don't want them slavishly to follow us, you know. Um, I think they were all sort of tuning in on that idea of in the new Aeon, um, you're not looking for a perfect master. You're looking for what you can select as an individual and um, work with. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting that the mixed success those individuals had. Uh, that's interesting too. I was reading about, that's interesting you bring that up. I was reading about Steiner yesterday for some reason. It's like one of these Wikipedia tunnels I get into. But he, uh, his, you know, the, the, his followers now have to constantly repudiate things that he said in these, <laughs> in these off the cuff lectures and say, well, you know, he might've said something racist, but we're, we're not racist and, you know, things that, that <laughs> yeah. so they're constantly yeah. having to backpedal now. So the fact that he never wanted these things published in the first place is, is, is pretty funny, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I I taught at a uh, Waldorf school for four hectic terms, and um, you see the sort of thing that when they were following in the seventies, there were some people were still following him slavishly, you know, and they put a big thing of studying Parseval, um, you know, which Wagner made into a into a, a magnificent piece of music, um, but. Uh, you weren't allowed to play Wagner's records of Wagner's Percival because that's not real thing. It must be live music, you know. Um, and so slavish is okay. a wonderful tool to be able to play Percival and, and blow the minds of your pupils was forbidden. But it's ridiculous, really, because when, when um, Steiner said that, Putting on a record is putting on a scratchy thing, you know, with a little tinny, mm. uh, putting a thing, a 78 record. Um, and it's true, that's no uh, match for real orchestral experience. But of course, now with, um, you know, digital recordings, things like that, uh, you're offering something magnificent to your pupils who do it. And I'm sure um, Steiner would have said, no, that's okay. You're giving them something magnificent playing that. But he was saying, no, no, recorded music is trash because it was in those days compared right. to the real experience. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> you've got to see it as a living thing and um, where it's moving. That's I see the people who are going to summon me. Have ah, arrived. okay, so, okay. Yeah. Do you need to wrap mm. up? Um, yeah, I think I had, yes. Okay. Four minutes, I've oh got. <laughs> okay. Mm. So, um, what are, what are our chances for enlightenment, Baba? Please tell us. <laughs> um, keep trying. <laughs> well, and, yeah. and why, why is why is life like an apple? <laughs> what, what? What you said that when you strung oh, words well, together, it was like, like an, an apple. apple. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. The reason is um, the first bite you taste that sweetness. And you just want to eat and eat. You love it so much. And then suddenly the bits are sticky on your teeth. You're chewing pips. It is horrible. You want to throw it away. But those seeds which stick in your teeth and taste bitter, if they are planted, they will produce another tree. And you will have an endless supply of apples. Yeah, and so on. That makes sense. <laughs> Have you considered doing another YouTube channel as this character? No, no. no I think it could. You, you would end up with fifty million followers. I think really. <laughs> yeah, you should definitely should think about that. <laughs> it would be pretty funny. Both, both, both. When I played um, his, you know, what's it, uh, uh, Doctor Evil, be my good. You know, the the chaos <laughs> preacher. And when I played that, it really blew my mind. You know, I Doctor My Good's voice was in my head for a month afterwards you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah <laughs> and the sort of aura of um Sri Baba Rebop was around a year later when people met me they said you know yeah I'm fat the other half I should dish you <laughs> so it, it's taking on a hell of a thing all right well thank you for for blessing us uh Sri Baba I've Rebop given a message no, I've got to go Is it from the secret <laughs> chiefs okay uh thank you again for being on Mm. Uh, okay. It's been an enormous pleasure, yeah. Me too. I enjoyed this. Okay, yeah. talk to you later. Okay, hope you really, really enjoyed that. That was Ramsey Dukes. Check out his YouTube and his books on Amazon. And check us out at magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E win learn the dark arts enjoy your life we'll see you there bye